Hey everyone, my name is Nick Wignall. I'm a clinical psychologist and the founder of The Friendly Mind, a free weekly newsletter where I share practical, evidence-based advice for emotional health and well-being. And in today's video, I'm gonna answer a reader question. A reader asks, I saw a tweet recently quoting psychologist Jonathan Haidt, which said, events in the world affect us only through our interpretations of them. So if we can control our interpretations, we can control our world. So my question is, does that mean that when it comes to emotional problems, it's all in our head? All right, I thought this was a really fascinating question because it brings up a lot of subtle but important ideas in emotional health. Now, the first thing I want to do is give a couple of really quick disclaimers. First of all, Jonathan Haidt is a super smart guy, so I don't want to claim or give the impression that this sentence is 100% accurate of Jonathan Haidt's beliefs because it's taken out of context, it's just one sentence, if I had to bet, I bet there's a lot of sentences before and after this, which give it um, nuance and context and sort of moderate it a little bit. So that's the first thing I wanna say. Instead, I wanna use this simply as a, it's a good launching off point to talk about some interesting ideas in emotional health and psychology. Okay, so that's the first thing there. Now, th this quotation, and let's go back to it again. It said, events in the world affect us only through our interpretation of them. So if we can control our interpretations, we can control our world. Now. Obviously, this is not 100% true. It's not completely accurate. Let's say somebody walked up to me, punched me in the face, and broke my nose. Regardless of how I interpret that event, I still have a broken nose. <laughs> so, obviously, events in the world can affect us physically. But I think the question, and this is what my reader's question gets at, is how do events affect us emotionally? And that is a much more complicated question, I think. And so let's let's kind of dig into that um, and explore this. And in fact, I would bet, and I haven't read the book that this quotation comes from, I would bet what Haidt is talking about with this quote is how events affect us emotionally, even though he doesn't say that specifically in the quote. I would bet if you read this chapter in the book, you would understand that, that would be implicit. So that's my bet, but I haven't read the book yet. Okay, so let's assume that what we're talking about here is the relationship between events that happen to us and how we feel emotionally. Now, a good, the example that came up when I was uh, when this person asked this question, I immediately thought of this, this instance in grad school I remember really vividly. I was in a seminar class and we were divided up um, into partners to, to each and we were given a little project and we went off and did the project and then we came back and presented sort of our findings to the class. And I remember my, my partner and I, we got done presenting our findings and I felt pretty good about it. Like I thought we had had a really good idea and we spent a lot of time on it and I was really proud of it. And then I remember people had kind of mixed feedback and our professor went last and gave this pretty scathing criticism of us and the project. Like it was, it was a little brutal. And I remember immediately feeling really defensive. I got angry, I was anxious, I was, uh, I felt a little bit guilty because after hearing the critique, <laughs> I think a part of me knew that it was actually a pretty legitimate good critique. So I felt a little bit guilty too. I didn't, you know, I didn't say, I didn't act out my defensiveness. I didn't get super angry, uh, but I felt that way inside. But I, what I was shocked by, I wasn't super shocked by my own reaction, but I was shocked by my partner and he, he immediately reacted with intense curiosity. He was almost excited that our professor had pointed out all these flaws and, and essentially told us our project was garbage. <laughs> and he just started asking these series of really interesting questions to understand how we had gotten it wrong and what was going on. And anyway, the point is we had, in response to the exact same event, our project being criticized, the two of us had dramatically different emotional reactions, which suggests that it's how we make sense of what happens to us that affects us emotionally, not necessarily the thing itself. It's not predetermined that if you get criticized, you're gonna feel defensive. A lot of people do, including me in that instance, but my partner, for instance, didn't, presumably because he did something very different internally in response to that criticism. He had a different set of interpretations. The story he told himself about what that meant was very different than the story I was telling myself. And as a result, we had very different emotional reactions. So I do think that assuming Haidt is talking about how events affect us emotionally, I do think his assertion here is basically true, that events themselves don't cause emotions. It's how we think about or interpret the events that happen to us that determines how we feel emotionally. And actually, this is a principle that has been around for a long time. So there's this, it's technically, it's called the principle of cognitive mediation. And it says that 
things don't cause emotions. It's our interpretation, our thoughts about things that lead to how we feel emotionally. Now, this isn't a new idea. This was codified kind of in the mid 20th century in terms of this principle of cognitive mediation, but it's been around for thousands of years. I mean, the, at least as early as the Greek and Roman Stoics, you know, two to two and a half thousand years ago. In fact, there's a famous quote from a Greek philosopher, Epictetus, and it goes, let me pull it up here. He said, people are not disturbed by things, but by the views they take on them. So again, same idea. It's not things that cause emotions. It's how we interpret things, how we view them that leads to our, whether we're disturbed or not, or what kind of emotion we have. So that we've known that for a long, long time, right? This idea has been around for a very long, the Buddhist, um, old kind of Buddhist tradition have very similar ideas. Um, so it's really well-known principle. It's also the cornerstone of a lot of modern psychotherapy. So again, back in the, the middle of the 20th century, the two kind of godfathers of cognitive therapy, Albert Ellis and Aaron Beck, they, both of them, were interested in Stoic philosophy, and they sort of imported this idea into modern psychology that um, it's not events that dictate our emotions, it's how we think about those events. And hence, they developed this new school of thought in psychotherapy called cognitive therapy, which essentially involved getting really good at noticing how we are interpreting or the stories we're telling ourselves about what's happening to us, and doing that in the most constructive, rational, balanced way possible. And their contention, which has been pretty well borne out, the better you are at controlling and managing the story you tell yourself about what happens to you, the more equanimity you tend to have in your emotional response, which is essentially, I think, what, what Jonathan Haidt is saying in that, in that quote. Now, this idea that it's the interpretation of events, our thoughts about events, that controls our emotions. This is actually more nuanced than it seems because of this tricky word control. So I think that the interesting question to ask ourselves is, to what degree do you control your thoughts? I think a lot of Stoic philosophy and a lot of the people who embrace this idea, including kind of cognitive therapists, maybe people like Jonathan Haidt, I don't wanna speak for him necessarily, but I think we can assume that because a lot of times we can control our thoughts. You know, if I tell you to um, think about what you had for breakfast today, you can probably go into your head and imagine, you can visualize it, you can remember what you were doing uh, before that. Or if I told you, add 17 plus 12 in your head. You could, that's, you know, it's a little complicated, but you could probably do that in your head. So we're all aware of the fact that we can control our thoughts a lot of the time. Because of that, it's easy to assume <laughs> that we can always control our thoughts or that other people can always control their thoughts. And that's not quite true <laughs> because if you talk to kind of cognitive psychologists, they'll tell you that a lot of thoughts are automatic. They're not under our control. A lot of thoughts are deliberate and they are under our control, but there are plenty that aren't. And th this actually should be super obvious. Sometimes thoughts just pop into our head. Like earlier today, I thought, ah, oh, shoot, I forgot to send this email. I didn't choose to have a thought about forgetting to send an email. That thought just popped into my head, totally unbidden by me. I did not decide to do that at all. However, once it popped in my head, once it was there, I did choose to think about, hmm, all right, what, do I wanna to respond to this email now? No, I'll put it on my to-do list and I'll get to it later this afternoon, stuff like that. So this gets at a really important distinction, another distinction among thoughts. The first distinction is automatic versus deliberate thoughts, right? And automatic ones we don't have control over, deliberate ones we do have control over. It's related to a similar distinction between what I call initial and elaborating thoughts. So an initial thought is one that just pops into your head, like a worry, for instance. There's all sorts of things that can just trigger a worry. However, after that initial worry pops into your mind, whether you continue to elaborate on that worry and continue worrying is a very different thing. That's an elaborative thought, and that is something you have control over. You can't decide if a worry pops into your head. You can decide and control whether you continue to worry about it. Same thing goes for rumination, say. If a memory of how someone wronged you or hurt you in the past pops in your mind, can't control that, that's a rumination, right? But whether you continue to ruminate on it and stew on it and dwell and replay that memory over and over again in your mind, that is something you can control. You are doing that, it's a mental behavior. Now, given that distinction, I think it's pretty fair to say that a lot of our emotional suffering comes from elaborative thinking. Something happens to us, a thought pops into our head, 
and it causes a little bit of emotional disturbance. A worry causes a little bit of anxiety. A rumination causes a little bit of frustration or irritability. But most of our difficult emotion, when we experience a ton of anxiety, when we get super anxious, or when we get really mad and pissed off, for instance, that is the result of all this elaborative thinking. It's not the, in the initial thought produced a little bit of emotion, but it's the heaps and heaps of elaborative thinking that we do afterwards that leads to that huge excess of emotion. So I think this is what um, height and ancient philosophers and cognitive therapists and just a lot of people are getting at with this idea is that we do have a lot of control over our emotional reactions to things. I think it's also true that things themselves don't have a predetermined effect on us. But the nuance I would like to add to this discussion, I think, is that just because you can control a lot of your thoughts about what happens to you doesn't mean you can control all of them. And the implication there is that you cannot, you don't have absolute control over your emotions. Sometimes things are going to happen and you're going to have automatic thoughts or beliefs pop up or memories or whatever. It, totally out of your control and that's going to produce at least a little bit of emotional disturbance and there is nothing you can do about that you could be the dalai lama <laughs> you could be the most sort of emotionally mature spiritually enlightened psychologically sophisticated person in existence and you are not going to get around that so here's my kind of take-home idea for this this question i think it's a very good general rule of thumb to believe that you and you alone are responsible for your emotions that doesn't mean you have absolute control over all of them, but you can control your emotional reactions to things to a much larger degree than most people realize. It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of practice. It takes a lot of self-awareness, but you can do it. It is a skill. And like any skill, if you're willing to be patient and work at it slowly and incrementally, you can get much, much better at it. So, of course, events in the world affect us, <laughs> including physically, but events don't cause emotions. It's our thoughts about what happens to us that causes how we feel emotionally. And while we can control much of our mental reactions to things, we can't control all of it, which means we don't have total control over our emotional reactions. That said, it's generally a very good idea, emotionally and psychologically speaking, to operate under the assumption that you do have a lot of control and therefore responsibility for how you feel emotionally, depending on how you think. So is it all in your head? No, but a lot of it is. If you're interested in learning more about how to get better at managing your thoughts and your emotions, building what I call mental strength and emotional resilience, I think there are two core skills that everybody should learn and practice and try to get really good at. And those are emotional validation, which is about being validating, normalizing, and compassionate with difficult thoughts and emotions. It's a very simple skill. It's not, um, it's not especially complex, but it does take a lot of practice to get good at. And then mindfulness training. So everybody's heard of mindfulness meditation and my various mindfulness practices. And people do those with a lot of goals, everything from spiritual enlightenment to relaxation or sleep or whatever. Mindfulness training is a very specific approach to mindfulness that I use that has nothing to do with relaxation or spiritual growth. <laughs> it's about attentional control. It's about good at noticing your reactions to things and then controlling those in a way that is helpful and serves your goals and values instead of just letting your mind get you know tossed around and pulled toward any old thing that pops pops into mind and this is a cornerstone this skill is a cornerstone of emotional health and resilience so i really encourage you to look into this practice of mindfulness training and both of these skills um, emotional validation and mindfulness training i've written a lot about and i will include links in the description to two guides i have on both of those topics those are good places to start to understand what those look like and to begin practicing them all right thanks for watching this video i hope you found it helpful if you'd like to get more thoughts and information from me about emotional health psychology well-being that sort of thing i write a free weekly newsletter called the friendly mind it goes out every monday morning and you can join for free using the link in the description below thanks